When it comes to my father, I found that it helps to compartmentalize him into a collection of facts rather than feelings. For instance, I can tell you that during his last visit to San Diego in the fall of 2016, there were 165 photos of his model train set on his iPad. And I can tell you that while I flicked through them, I was reminded that six is the number of photos that exist in the entire world where my father and I appear in the same frame. And four of those have been taken on that same visit. I've been curating such clues since before I tracked him down at the age of 18. And while they are few in number, they've told me more about him than he ever has. He has never tried to play the role of my father, and I have never acted like his son. Instead, I'm a detective. He is the noun who verbed me. <laughs> and there is something I am trying to get out of him that he does not want to tell me. What happened that made him who he is? I want to know because I don't want to turn out like it. Ingratiating myself to him over the years has progressed slowly and with great care, always at my initiation and always requiring a psychological running start. Each phone call I've made has been greeted by a request to hold on, followed by the opening and bang of a screen door, then the flick, flick, catch of a lighter, sizzle of leaves, and a long, steadying exhalation of smoke. And then we'd sit on the line together for hours, most of it filled with enormous silences, cautious and patient. He had to do most of the talking during those calls. I hadn't learned enough about him to know what questions to ask. The only reason I wanted to see him in person was because I finally did. So I meet him in the Pacific Beach Ale House next to his hotel, and after hugging the hug of two men who know they should have a bond but don't, I have our waitress move us upstairs to the balcony. He's pushing 70 and has only recently given up smoking. The lateness of the change is evident in the pause he takes halfway up the stairs and the embarrassed wave he gives the couple behind us to let them pass. I'm grateful he still drinks, though, for both of our sakes. Not because I want to hurt him or make him uncomfortable. He isn't a bad absent father as far as absent fathers go. He's given me things during our brief time knowing one another. Not materialistic other than his old 1970s Nikon, but moments that have shaped me nonetheless. The moment most on my mind was the one phone call he ever initiated. It was during September 11th, 2001, and I was watching the World Trade Center burn down live and in person. My father had been at work in Milwaukee when somebody came in shouting about the attack and he ran off the job to call his son, and somehow he got through. Don't let this fuck you up, was the first thing he said. It's a choice, don't ever forget that. And then the line went dead again. He and I had never talked about that conversation in all the years that followed, but by the fall of 2016, I needed to. I needed to understand how he'd known what he said was true because I was fucked up by that point, badly. And he was the last living family member I had that might be able to understand why. Nobody had ever explicitly told me he'd been in a war, but my little collection of facts suggested it. Growing up, my mother had stopped talking about my father as soon as I had the ability to recognize that doing so caused her pain, and I'd stopped. Until, of course, I became a teenager, when inflicting pain on a parent becomes palpable, <laughs> if not outright enjoyable. And it was during that phase that I'd asked her, was he in Vietnam? And she told me that he had been drafted, but I could not accept her answer that she didn't know what happened afterwards. Vietnam was a meat grinder, was all she said. And after you lost as many friends to it as we had, it wasn't something people brought up anymore. So neither of us ever did. Her answer had exasperated me. And so I resolved to find out the truth for myself. After 9-11, I decided that day had come. Because if my father had been in a meat grinder, well, at least I knew what it smelled like. 
So the following summer, I decided to visit him in the home he'd made for himself in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And I brought my college girlfriend along with me. Because what young woman doesn't want to spend part of her summer visiting her boyfriend's absent father? <laughs> and in scenic Waukesha, a town known equally for its healing springs, as well as its complete absence of laws governing the sale of alcohol. <laughs> other than that they be bought in quantities and consumed in a way that would give a thinking person pause. But also where every evening we spent our nights together drinking and smoking with him in his backyard, watching fireflies come alive on his half acre of property. A scene that struck me even then as the perfect resting place for a man who'd learned the merits of silence the hard way. I worked up the courage early during that visit to ask him about Vietnam, but all he said in reply was that it was all about being bored off your ass 95% of the time and scared off at the rest. I wanted to ask him how he knew that being fucked up was a choice, but the silence that followed that statement said louder than any words could, that was the end of that. But it wasn't. Two nights later, while I was inside pissing out all the beer we'd been sucking down that weekend, I came back out to my father telling my girlfriend a story and her urgently waving me over to hear it. He was telling her in full swing about how he'd been picked out of the lottery while he was on break from college in Rochester, where he was studying photography. And rather than subject himself to a random draft, he'd enlisted in the Navy. That much was already corroborated fact for me. But the alcohol-inspired confession that followed answered for me finally what that decision had amounted to. How, after learning he had a specific skill set in photography, the Navy had assigned him to dangle from the rig out the door of a helicopter somewhere over the demilitarized zone. Twice, he told, he'd been on board helicopters that had taken fire and been forced to land, but on both occasions, another bird had come tearing in to retrieve them before anything more came of it. On the third outing, however, things got and stayed as fucked as any nom story I have ever heard since. My father and his crew had done their routine float and photo job and received the routine incoming rounds that wrecked the Huey's ability to stay airborne, but this time the crash was hard. The pilot killed on impact, the co-pilot broke his arm, and as my father crawled out of the wreckage, he saw a 14-year-old boy running towards him holding an AK-47, shouting something that he couldn't understand. And then my father said he shot that boy until he was quiet. Afterwards, they all walked away until they found a South Vietnamese army unit to take them in. And his final statement on the subject was, how do you do a thing like that and raise a child? <laughs> it wasn't a question, and we never talked about it since. I certainly was not going to push it. He'd given me everything I thought I needed from him at the time. That story meant he'd endured a worse trauma than I could have ever understood, than a marriage or the bonds of parenthood even could be expected to accommodate. It absolved us both, him, me, of being abandoned, him, of doing the abandoning. And if I'd left it there, it might have been a monumental beginning to a second chance for us to have a relationship. But I fucked it up. I had to precisely because he could not talk about it. Those who know don't talk. That, for me, had been understood as a kind of law among baby boomers who had been to war, but I still needed to, because as perfect a moment as his confession was for me to hear as a son, it just wasn't enough for me as a survivor. It's an ugly thing to be a survivor. There was never an opportunity for me to earn it, my college dorm was a block away from the trade towers, but I had slept there the night before they were destroyed. I was at my girlfriend's apartment a mile north in Columbus Circle where she had to shake me out of bed. But worse than that, I got a disaster boner off 9-11. I knew the names of some of the people who died and I mourned them, but it didn't change the fact that for me the air was never sweeter or the sky so blue as that very same afternoon because I was alive and now I knew it. It took months to feel guilty about it. 
And despite my father telling me not to, eventually I did let it fuck me up. So I decided my only solution was for me to earn back the right to be alive. Three years later, after 9-11 and that conversation in his backyard, I joined the United Nations as an aid worker, where I volunteered for South Sudan. And there, finally, I adopted my father's silence for my own. Because fuck, feeling, fuck talking about feelings when you've got facts. One fact is that I watched a woman howl over a grave she dug by the light of a bonfire, and for a moment, I believed in hell. A fact is that I stopped feeling like I needed to ever prove my manhood to anyone after other men had tried to kill me, and I pissed myself when they were doing it, but so did my buddy, and we had a good laugh afterwards. <laughs> a fact is that I put a teenage boy in jail, a former child soldier, who was fired from a job for huffing glue and who came into my compound to get revenge on my team, even though we didn't have anything to do with it. And I hunted him down, and I put him in a prison that looked more like a gladiator arena, and I felt nothing when I did it. Because fuck him. Fuck me. And fuck raising kids after that. I loved every day I spent in South Sudan, because everyone around me lived according to the same fact. No one gets what they deserve. So drink whatever there is to drink without worrying how much lead might be in it. Love whoever will let you go to bed, wake up, and do it again the next day because everyone's going to die eventually. Except that kind of thinking actually is not a fact. That's a matter of faith. And all the guilt and shame I felt overseas was waiting for me when I came home. I tried every trick and jumped into every distraction I could manufacture from alcoholism to workaholism, and it bought me nine years. But I still ended up calling up my father and asking him to come all the way out to the fucking PD Ale House of all places on a Tuesday night in the fall of 2016 because he was the only person I had left in my phone who might be living in the same world I was. And we talk about nothing for a long time, as we are wont to do, until I drop a statement. I tell him that I'm okay that he hadn't been around when I was growing up. I'm not mad at him about it, not anymore. If he'd stuck around, it probably would have ended in me hating him. Shit, maybe I would have even become a Republican just to fuck with him. <laughs> he laughs and agrees with me. Fair enough. We agree on that much, at least. And then I bring up during his call during 9-11. Oh, fuck. What an asshole I was. I sound just like all those fuckers who tell people to just get over their shit. No, I say, no, 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 no. No, it meant everything to me that he'd said it. I need him to understand so badly that I just blurted it out in a mess. Mm -hmm. I need you to tell me what happened, man. I need you ha to tell me how you learned to deal with what happened in Vietnam. I need to hear it. I'm not a tourist. I can tell you story after story all night long about what happened in South Sudan, about who died horribly for nothing and what they meant to me and how I dream about them still. He keeps his eyes on his drink the whole time. And I can tell he wants that cigarette. Flick, sizzle, hold on. But I don't hold on, though. I can't. I tell him about how I could speak firsthand now about seeing cowardice committed by good men and heroism by cowards, about knowing I was going to die and then somehow not dying only just when I'm finally ready to and then wishing I had in the years that followed. I could talk about coming home and not knowing who to tell or how to tell it, only that I needed to and I wanted to tell him because he's my father and now finally I'm his son. And if we could just finally fucking talk about it, maybe we can stop this shit from being passed on to another generation. And when I finish, he starts laughing. We're drunk. <laughs> okay, we're really fucking drunk. But this is not the chuckle of nervous intoxication. This is appreciation of a joke that only one of us is in on. And finally, he speaks. Everything I told you about Vietnam was total bullshit. <laughs> I cock my head like a dog that's been shown a card trick. 
he tells me the story he told on that back porch was just a patchwork lie he'd collected from other veterans he'd known, anecdotes he'd heard over drinks or weed in the years since they'd come back home, but he'd never left. He was discharged from the Navy in San Diego after two years. Everything else he said had happened had, but not to him. A fact is not a fact until it's verified. But he has given me two new ones for my collection, at least. Maybe the last he ever will. He'll never be my father. And I'm honestly alone with my war. But because I never shake the instinct to be congenial company, even though it is the last thing I want to do, I laugh with him. But when I put him to bed, when I finally come home, I stumble into my garage and I slide down to the concrete floor. <laughs> I cry my fucking heart out. But when I finish, I decide I'm ready to talk. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>